So let's now extend this idea of t-test to one-way ANOVA, and that's as complex as we're going to go with this. So t-test has your independence of error, normality of dv at each level of the iv, and equal variance assumptions. These assumptions also hold with ANOVA, and so let's now go through this much more detailedly and, and go through all of these assumptions. So we're going to use the SOI data set. So just to remind you, this is the data set looking at sperm count, depending on the amount of soy meals a person, uh, man eats per week. So if we pull up the histogram of sperm count by the number of soy meals, the first thing we notice is that our distributions are absolutely terrible. Well, let's just do that. So we got positive skews, we have a very lept, um, leptocodic distribution here, and some of these are very platocodic. So normality looks like it's been violated pretty hardcore. And when we look at equal variance, we can also see that this has been violated really hard too, and you only need to look at the standard deviations to see this. However, what we do notice is that we have a balanced design. So again, the big issue with the standard deviations here is the seven soy meal group, which have much, much smaller standard deviations than the others. So now we can run our ANOVA. And I'm blitzing through this because we've already done this analysis before. This is just a refresher. Our ANOVA said that there was a marginal effect, but really, you know, it's not quite significant. So we can sort of go at this point, well, maybe that's because we have such a terrible distribution and such terrible issues with variance. So we can rerun the analysis as a Kruskal-Wallis test. And now the structure for this syntax is exactly the same as the rank sum. So it's k Wallace dv comma, and then we have this by subcommand coming up. Now the Kruskal Wallace test has slightly different output to um, to what we saw with the Man Whitney test. So here we see the different groups, their observations, and we see the rank sum. What we don't see is the expected rank sums like we got for the Man Whitney. We get two different kinds of p-values, one based off a, um, a chi-square and the other is a chi-squared with ties. Remember before I was talking about having uh, accounting for ties is really important. So we're going to use the chi-squared with ties. So the chi-squared gives us a score of 8.659 on 3 degrees of freedom. And this gives us a p-value of 0 0.03, it's significant. And if we compare this p-value to the p-value up here, you make quite different conclusions. Using non-parametrics, it's a solid, significant difference. Using parametric analyses, it's marginal at best. <clears throat> so, we know that this is significant, and we can see based off the rank sums that no soy meals appear to have the largest amount of sperm, and then one in four soy meals appear to have about the same, and then seven soy meals seem to have the least sperm. So, the question then is, well, are these actually different from each other? So just like an ANOVA, which tells you, or an omnibus ANOVA, which tells you that there is a difference somewhere, but doesn't tell you where that lies, the same with Kruskal Wallace, it tells you that there is a difference, but it doesn't tell you where that difference lies. So we need to go ahead and do contrast testing. Now, there is a bit of a technicality here. Um, Stata doesn't have the Dunnett's test by default built in, so we need to install it. It's a custom package. To do this, we go search done test, because that's what the command is called. We click on this first one here, and then you go click here to install. Now what you'll notice is mine comes up with a message saying all files already exist and are up to date. If you're installing this and you're working on, say, iLab, 
what you might find is that you'll get a different message. Mine is saying this because I've already installed it onto my personal laptop, so I don't have to reinstall it. But for you, you'll see a, um, a number of lines coming down as Stata installs its package. So now I'm able to run the done it test, and it follows the exact same structure as kwallace, just I'm going to say done test now. And what I'm getting now are pairwise comparisons between each of my um, different pairs of, of levels. So here I can see the comparison of no soy to soy, to one soy meal, no soy to four, to seven, one to four, one to seven, and then four to seven. And there's not a lot of instruction as to what's going on here, but this top number is your test statistic, and then the bottom number is your p-value. And one of the ways that I can tell this is you can't actually have p-values above one. So to see that there are scores above one is a nice indication that these aren't p-values. What I can also see is up here it says choline minus romine. Now don't take this to indicate that you're looking at mean scores. What you're actually looking at is rank means and differences between them. So now if I look at the relationship between no soy and soy, I can see the p-value is 0.3826, it's non-significant. And what I notice is that the test statistics, so, so the difference in the means, as well as the p-value here, is exactly the same as no soy to four soy meals. Now that should not be surprising at all because they actually have the exact same values. I can see that there is a significant difference, however, between no soy and soy meal, and having seven soy meals per week. The mean difference in ranks is positive, and because I know it's column minus rows, that means it's no soy's mean rank minus seven soy. And as we've spoken before, the only way this difference could be positive is if the first number in my equation up here was larger than the second which means that my no soy rank has to be larger than my seven soy rank. So this tells me that those who don't have any soy have a significantly greater amount of sperm than those who have seven soy meals per week. And then I can also see that for seven soy meals per week, again, it's still less than, they have less sperm than those who have one or four soy meals. And again, I'm seeing the exact same statistics for both because there's no difference between one and four soy meals and that's reflected in the fact that the difference is zero. The p-value isn't exactly one here because there is variation around one and four soy meals and maybe that variation is not perfectly the same but their means are the same. So I can now conclude on this and say that there is evidence to suggest that having seven soy meals per week is going to significantly reduce the amount of sperm you have compared to having no soy meals, one soy meal, or four soy meal per week. Having, less th having four or less soy meals per week does not seem to affect your sperm count. And we can tell this because there's no significant difference between no soy, one soy, or four soy meals per week. All the differences lie um, with seven soy meals per week. However, just like with the Mann-Whitney test, I can't actually make any conclusions about the magnitude of the difference. I can look at these differences and say, well, the difference, the gap is larger for no soy to seven versus one four to seven, but I can't put actual numbers down. I can't start making predictions or anything like that. I can just talk about the general order of effects. So that brings us to the end of non-parametrics. They're a really simple analysis. They're not too complicated and they have really easy interpretations. But just as a reminder, the major limitation is you can't talk about them in parametric sensors. So once you get the results, you can't go back to the mean because you've already deemed the mean inappropriate. Uh, and that really leaves you going, so how am I going to conclude on this? What, what exactly am I going to talk about? And more often than not, you're simply going to be talking about order of effects. So what's largest, what's smallest, without being able to actually put a number on that, what that largeness actually is.